The waves rolled in and the wind whipped across the deck, and despite the crew's best efforts, the hatch caved in, letting in tons and tons of ice-cold lake water. Could they close the hatch once more? Would the pumps be able to stop the flooding? And most importantly, would SS Henry Steinbrenner and her crew survive the night? Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday. My name is Eleanor. Just a quick disclaimer for a younger audience before we dive in. This story may be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Okay, everyone, let's get into it. We're back on the Great Lakes. Our poll results were so close, so we did the Bermuda Triangle last week, and this week we're back on the lakes. Let's get started with SS Henry Steinbrenner. The Steinbrenner, named for the great-grandfather of former New York Yankees owner George Steinbrenner, was a lakes cargo freighter built for the Kinsman Transit Company based out of Cleveland, Ohio. She was built as hole number 14 by Jenks Ship Building Company in Port Huron, Michigan, being launched on September 28, 1901, and completed sometime shortly after this. Before we get into her history, let's cover the specs. SS Henry Steinbrenner weighed in at 4,719 tons, and again, this is an American vessel, so this is in imperial tons. Continuing in imperial measurements, she was 427 feet long, had a beam of 50 feet wide, and a depth of 28 feet tall. Now we'll get into the metric system. In metric tons, she weighed in at 4,281 tons, and in metric measurements, she was 130 meters long, had a beam of 15 meters wide, and a depth of 8.5 meters tall. Her cargo capacity was right around 6,500 imperial tons, and she was manned by 31 crew. She had one deck and 12 hatches at 24 feet along the length of the ship with telescoping hatch covers. Just like many other cargo freighters on the lakes at this time, her hull and keel were dark maroon red with a white superstructure in the fore and aft sections of the vessel, being long and skinny like the five Great Lakes. The forward superstructure had the crew cabins with her bridge atop that, and her aft section featured a large cabin over the engine room where the galley, mess rooms, and other crew cabins were housed, being topped with a single smokestack and air vents. Later, the Steinbrenner would feature a doghouse cabin aft of her smokestack to house added crew due to a change in the crew watch system on the Great Lakes, and this change happened around 1921. Her U.S. identification number was 96584. As for propulsion, the ship was equipped with coal-fired Scotch Marine boilers that powered a steam-reciprocating triple expansion engine. This engine had 23-inch, 38-inch, and 63-inch diameter bores and a 40-inch stroke. And in metric measurements, the bores were 580 millimeters, 970 millimeters, and 1600 millimeters in diameter, with a 1000 millimeter stroke. This engine was capable of producing 1,750 horsepower or 1,287 kilowatts, and it fed a single fixed propeller, powering the ship at speeds of around 12 knots, which is 22 kilometers per hour or 14 miles per hour. We also need to keep in mind that this ship was built before 1948, and many ships built during this time frame were built with steel that contained higher than safe levels of sulfur, making the hulls of these ships brittle in colder temperatures. She'd begin a very eventful career in 1902, and we'll get to that now. But before we continue, if you're enjoying this video, leave me a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and let me know down in the comments section below. Okay, back to the story. SS Henry Steinbrenner was temporarily enrolled at Fairport, Ohio on November 14, 1901, with her home port at this time being listed as Cleveland, Ohio. Before her career could even start, SS Henry Steinbrenner was in trouble. She was on the Black River and attempted to leave on November 14, 1901, when she'd run into the south approach of the 10th Street Bridge in Cleveland, Ohio, causing significant property damage. She'd leave Black River on November 15, 1901, later being permanently enrolled at Cleveland, Ohio on January 10, 1902. 
SS Henry Steinbrenner entered service in 1902, and her first two decades of service were quite eventful. On either December 5th or 6th, 1909, sources differ, the Steinbrenner was downbound on the St. Mary's River loaded with iron ore when she'd collide with the nearly brand new SS Harry A. Burwind. The Steinbrenner actually sank to the bottom of the river and was thus declared a total constructive loss, though she would be recovered six months later on May 10th or 26th, 1910, sources differ again, by Reed Wrecking Company. She was repaired and sent back into service on August 10th, 1910, like nothing ever happened. If you want to hear about another ship that has had bizarre incidents early on in her career, check out our episode on SS Eastland. After this, her career into the early 1920s was decently uneventful, with her cargo hold being rebuilt in 1921, as well as that expansion for extra crew we talked about earlier. However, she wouldn't escape the Roaring Twenties unscathed. On October 11, 1923, SS Henry Steinbrenner was in Whitefish Bay on Lake Superior in heavy fog when she'd collide with SS John McCartney Kennedy. Luckily, the Steinbrenner managed to limp to harbor this time, though it would cost $5,000 in repairs before she could resume her service. In 2023, that would be $87,810, given the rate of inflation from 1923 to 2023. After this collision, the Steinbrenner's career was rather unnoteworthy up until her sinking 30 years later in 1953. SS Henry Steinbrenner was a 52-year-old cargo vessel when she left Twin Ports in Superior, Wisconsin at 5.11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sunday, May 10, 1953, packed with nearly 7,000 imperial tons of iron ore destined for the steel mills on Lake Erie. At the time of her departure, the weather was clear, though forecasts predicted harsher weather later that day. While nowadays we might consider leaving port with a harsh storm on the way mind-boggling, it was a common practice at this time for captains to leave port despite forecasts predicting bad weather on the lakes. We also have to note that meteorologists did not have the technology we have now, and so their weather reports were far less accurate than modern forecasts. Plus, many captains and crews had endured many a storm during their careers, so it wasn't as big of a deal to them as it probably should have been. Another case of captains and crews going out into Great Lakes storms when they shouldn't have was the sinking of SS Edmund Fitzgerald, and we do have an episode on her if you're interested. Later that day as the time passed into the afternoon, SS Henry Steinbrenner met those foul forecasts. Strong winds and enormous waves rolled on by and buffeted the ship, with the ship's captain, Captain Albert Stiglin, securing the ship's deck. However, he didn't have the crew place tarpaulins on the 12 leaf type hatch covers, and since they were not watertight, they allowed some water to seep into the cargo holds over a long period of time. They should have done this since later on around 8 p.m., one of the leaves on the number 11 hatch got loose and allowed water into the hold. At this point, some of the crew were dispatched to secure the cover once more. However, the storm picked up and the 80 mile per hour or 129 kilometer per hour winds, as well as the large waves, just loosened the leaf again. As if this wasn't bad enough, doors and vents around the ship were being blown open by the ferociousness of the storm. If you're interested in hearing about a particularly violent Great Lakes storm, check out our episode on the Great Lakes storm of 1913. At this point, it was too dangerous to send crew members out on deck, with the crew instead starting pumps in the holds, however, the flooding was not able to be contained. Captain Stiglin attempted to steer the ship away from the waves to avoid causing more damage to the holds, but unfortunately, by morning the following day on May 11th, 1953, other hatch covers had come loose and the ship struggled to push on. After a few more desperate maneuvers, the writing on the wall was clear. SS Henry Steinbrenner was doomed to sink. Shortly after 7 a.m., an SOS call went out, with an abandoned ship signal being blown on the whistle just 35 minutes later. At this point, the crew mustered the forward life raft and the aft lifeboats, with the storm adding to the chaos. As SS Henry Steinbrenner settled in the water, confusion spread like wildfire and several men ended up in the water or were injured. The vessel sank quickly roughly 15 nautical miles, which is 28 kilometers or 17 miles, south of Isle Royal Light, also called Menagerie Island Light, near Michigan. Multiple ships were steaming toward the site of the sinking after being alerted by the SOS call, including the Queen of the Lakes at that time, SS Joseph H. Thompson, SS Wilfred Sykes, SS D. M. Clemson, SS D. G. Kerr, SS William E. Corey, and the Canadian ship 
Hachalaga. These ships conducted an extensive search for any survivors, with SS Joseph H. Thompson and her captain Robert F. Lang finding the forward life raft and rescuing the six men in it. SS D. M. Clemson and her captain Arthur M. Everett found one of the aft lifeboats with an unknown number of survivors clinging to it. Captain Everett carefully moved the ship to put the lifeboat in the ship's lee, having their survivors lifted up aboard with ropes. They were then escorted to the captain's quarters, where they were fed warm food and given dry clothing to wear. SS Wilfred Sykes found the other aft lifeboat and rescued them, again with an unknown number of survivors. Fourteen crew were rescued from the sinking on May 11, 1953. In total, 17 men perished. Immediately, the blame game started, with the first stone being cast at the crew for not using the tarpaulins on the hatches. However, in a storm of this magnitude, even the tarpaulins might not have mitigated the disaster. The loss of SS Henry Steinbrenner solidified a decision for Great Lakes vessel operators, and that was to equip some of their aging ships with watertight single-piece hatch covers during rebuilds to avoid the same fate. Some of the examples of ships that received this were SS L.E. Block, SS George W. Perkins, and SS Willis B. Boyer. One of the survivors of SS Henry Steinbrenner's sinking, Norm Bragg, was a watchman aboard the ill-fated SS Daniel J. Morrell when she sank in Lake Huron, and he must have felt the blood drain from his face when he saw what had happened to that vessel. As the sinking was happening, he gave the crew quick advice, explained their situation, and said some haunting words. Quote, It's been good to know you. I won't tell you everything that happens with that story, and we do have an episode on SS Daniel J. Morrell if you are interested. This episode couldn't be possible without our lovely patrons. Thank you all so much. If you'd like to support the channel and future episodes, go to patreon.com slash shipwrecksunday to join. The wreck of SS Henry Steinbrenner was actually only just recently discovered. She was located by a pair of Minnesota shipwreck hunters, Ken Merriman and Jerry Eliason, in September of 2023. She sits in 750 feet or 228.6 meters of water near Isle Royal Light. I'm so grateful that we've discovered where this ship rests so that more research can be continued on her story to find out every detail of why she sank. The important thing to remember here is the fact that 17 lives were lost, and I hope they all rest in peace and that their families have found acceptance, peace, and solace. SS Henry Steinbrenner's sinking was uniquely tragic despite the fact it was likely caused by an error that would be very easy to make, and it makes it all the more sad and relatable. That is the story of SS Henry Steinbrenner. If you liked that story and wanted to hear something else on the Great Lakes, check out our episode on SS Carl D. Bradley. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. Stay tuned next week for the story of M.V. George Prince, a ferry that tragically sank on the Mississippi River in 1976. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.